So welcome everyone, thank you for coming out uh, on a Thursday afternoon at 3.30. Um, I hope we have uh, an exciting panel for you. We certainly have a prestigious panel lined up. Um, this is the collection and use of evidence from abroad, and I'm going to uh, introduce the speakers um, going down the line. So uh, immediately to my right is Bruce Garris. Bruce is a partner at Berliner, Cochrane and Rowe uh, in Washington, D.C. Bruce does a wide variety of criminal work, especially white collar. Um, he's handled evidence gathering and extradition cases involving uh, prisoner transfer applications. He's testified as an expert in international criminal cases involving money laundering and tax crimes. And since 1985, he has edited the International Law Enforce, or sorry, the International Enforcement Law Reporter, which is a monthly publication. I think there are copies on the back. It's an impressive uh, publication if you want to grab one on the way out. Then next to Bruce is Marcus Funk. Um, I've known Marcus for a while. Uh, he's the firm-wide chair of Perkins Coie's White Collar Investigative Practices. He was a former federal prosecutor from Chicago, a section chief with the U.S. State Department in the Balkans, and a clerk with the Federal Court of Appeals and District Court. He's a law professor at uh, Oxford University, the University of Chicago. He's had a recent publication from Oxford University Press, which I think he is going to discuss or review uh, during his presentation. Um, and uh, then next to Marcus, we have Maureen Bassett. Uh, Maureen is a, an experienced federal prosecutor in Northern California. She is the US Attorney's International Coordinator um, she developed, and sorry, she develops and implements a program uh, that obtains evidence uh, for foreign investigators and prosecutors. She is the former resident legal advisor to the U.S. Embassy in Accra, in Ghana. And then finally, we have uh, Martha Borsch, who is a founding partner of Borsch and Ilofsky, a local firm here in San Francisco. She is the former AUSA for the Northern District of California. She's the recipient of the Attorney General's Distinguished Service Award in 2009 for work on a complex international money laundering case involving the former Prime Minister of the Ukraine. She's a fellow of the American College of Trial Lawyers and she specializes in complex civil and criminal cases. So hopefully we have an informative and entertaining panel lined up for you. Um, we are going to start with the MLAT and letters rogatory process. Uh, we're going to uh, work our way forward then to the Cloud Act. Um, so we'll start with the actual evidence gathering process abroad, and then we're going to look at the use of evidence uh, in US trial courts. We're gonna start with Marcus, and the way that um, the slides are lined up, we'll switch positions, I think would be the easiest. Okay. All right. And it should be. Thanks very much, Tyler, and uh, very nice to see you guys. We're intimate gathering here today, so you know, please don't be shy to throw your hardest questions at my co-panelists. Um, uh, so I'm going to just do a, a quick kind of primer or, or primer, uh, as you will, um, uh, on evidence gathering from abroad, MLATs and letters rogatory. What I'm going to talk about are MLATs and letters rogatory. Um, the thing to remember is MLATs or Mutual Legal Assistance Treaties. I mean, are, are, how many of you guys are familiar with MLATs, at least generally? Okay, okay, so 50-50 split or so. Um, so the, the key is that MLATs are really only tools available to, pro to prosecutors, right? They're, they're treaties between, in, in our case, the United States and another country, uh, uh, or in some instances, groups of countries, uh, and they essentially obligate the part participants or the parties to the treaty to help the other country gather evidence. That could be testimony, that could be gathering documents, et cetera. In the U.S., as, as some of us are familiar, you know, when, when we get an incoming request, uh, a district judge will appoint a, um, uh, an, an AUSA to basically gather information uh, or, ga or conduct the interview, what have you. And so uh, we are currently involved in, 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 in sort of trying to fight an MLAT uh, uh, involving the largest uh, emerald uh, 
in the world, 900 pound emerald, quite beautiful. I'm a, I've never seen it, but you know, it's out there somewhere in the sheriff's office. Um, and we're trying to prevent the Brazilian government from taking it back. And uh, our government is saying, we ha we, even though this is kind of probably a questionable legal theory that Brazilians are using, we're obligated to return it because the Brazilians have asked us to and we have an MLAT. So we're kind of working that, that fun case through the, um, the court system now. But again, the, the, the number one thing to remember is it applies um, to governments, not to individuals. The practitioner's tip um, uh, that we have here, um, and I see the, it's very interesting that the, what I have in front of my, I mean here and that what's up there don't match up. <laughs> kind of challenging. <laughs> is that right? Yeah, it is. How does that work? Okay, great. Um, so hold on. Uh, we'll see if we can fix it. That's okay. It's more challenging. Than <laughs> so, so practitioner's tip basically is, you know, you go to court and, 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 the, and, and, the, and you say, well, you know, the government's getting this, this, you know, deposition or whatever. We'd like to speak to the person too. The government could say, well, no, you're not allowed to. This MLAT only applies to us. District courts usually have sort of take a, a negative view of that because they don't like to have their schedules messed with. And so they will sometimes tell the prosecutor who always you know, obligingly will say, yes, sure, yes, your honor, um, that it might maybe, you know, you can kind of tag along with the prosecutor in terms of their evidence gathering so to keep everything streamlined and to keep it fair. Um, then you have, uh, I can't, I'm trying to think of other fun stories to talk about uh, while we're at it. Uh, Okay, right. Still is not matching up. That's okay. We'll just. We'll, you, you don't need this. This is this is uh, unnecessary. It's my cheat sheet here. Um, so that's really the main thing. And I'll, and I'll we'll want to make sure we leave a lot of time for our for, for for this distinguished panel, and also so we have time to, to to talk about some of these issues if you have questions. But over 60 countries, European Union, uh, the U.S. has has MLATs with. You can look them up. And they're very similar. They all have a certain sort of uh, tonality to them. One of the key things is there's no dual prosecution requirement, which is key. So in other words, even though uh, a particular offense may not be illegal in the United States, if we agree to gather information for a foreign country, we don't look into whether or not it's also illegal here. Um, and again, the US government does very little to sort of weigh in on whether or not that request is reasonable, should be granted as a matter of law. There are very few exceptions where the government, our government, will, will say they're not going to grant the MLAT request. In the Brazilian case, it's all public record, of course, um, initially the Brazilian government creatively said, we want this emerald that our clients own, like literally own a court in California has declared them the owner, a bona fide purchaser for value. They said, we want it as an exhibit in the trial. Uh, against the people who mined it down in Brazil. So we'll put a little exhibit sticker on it. We need it in, to really have this 900 pound emerald in Brazil. U.S. government said, yeah, that, that's kind of stretching a little bit. You know, picture probably will do it. Um, uh, so then they said, well, okay, we're gonna wanna forfeit it. We wanna forfeit it as an instrument, as a proceeds of unlawful activity. Mind you, the people who mined it 20 years ago and my, our, our clients, there's like 20 people in between. Uh, and we said, wait a minute, you know, bona fide purchase for value, pretty basic concept of law, uh, also applicable in, in, in Brazil. And, the, and they said, the DOJ said, well, you know, that's a great argument, bring it up with the Brazilian court, uh, which as you might ma imagine is not the most favorable venue. So that's kind of where it is. But it shows you how MLATs can be used and frankly how when the government kind of sinks their teeth into an MLAT request, there's very, there are very few ways around it. Uh, and it has force of law, you know, US government, uh, federal court will, will enforce it. Um, can I, well, sorry, yeah, maybe sure. I can ask while sure. you're, so the MLATs um, conceptually, are, are they through the whole criminal process? They can be pre-conviction, post-conviction, it doesn't matter? Yeah, they can be pre-indictment, investigative uh, tool, but again, it's only prosecutors, right? So you as an individual, and this gets us to the letters rogatory, right. which are only once you have a filed case, you as an individual, you know, attorney for, let's say, a, a defendant or a person being investigated, have absolutely no legal right to, to demand anything under an MLAT, um, which makes it, it's, it, it is an inequality of arms, I mean, basically, which is not, you know, as a former federal prosecutor, I thought that was great. I, I, I mean, and, and that's something the U.S. just started doing in 1988, um, and in the UN model convention, it is open to, yep. to defendants. The, and the US has browbeat other countries to have that clause. The clause says this convention can only be used 
between the prosecutors. In no way can be used by defendants or third parties, right. such as in forfeiture cases. Right. Right. Absolutely right. But you know, I don't want to interrupt the flow of your no. presentation. But I'm this is going way back in my memory now. But I, I was involved in. Uh, uh, I can't remember what the successor of Napster was, but do you remember this file sharing service? Yeah. Uh, and it was the individual in New Zealand who legally changed his name to .com. Uh, in the US, uh, FBI, Department of Justice, started an investigation for copyright infringement. Some of the servers were located in Canada, which is where I was based and where I'm from, and uh, they executed an MLAT request. Um, this was pre-conviction. And then after they had gathered the evidence, they had a sending hearing. So. At that point, uh, Mr. Dot Com and affected parties could come forward and make representations, if I recall correctly, to say, uh, you know, yes, this is a valid MLAT, but the way that it was executed, for example, uh, infringes my Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. So mm -hmm. during the MLAT process, is there room for uh, 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 an interested party to chat? I know it's between just between prosecutors, but can an interested party in the property, for example, uh, like the jewel that you're talking about, make representations to the court. You can try to. You can make. You can make arguments that um, that that essentially the request is a, a, a sham. But but effectively, at least we've we found out to, unfortunately, uh, so far that um, there's really very little a third party can do to intervene and somehow derail an MLAT request, other than trying to persuade the U.S. government that it's just a bogus unfair request and that you're depriving American citizen of, of their, of their they can, any any company country can come along and grab anything. And all we need to have is some bureaucrat in DC say, oh, it's okay, F figure it out in Ukraine. You know, and it's easy. Yes. I mean, you know, you're, you're taking a $900 million um, item away from someone who paid money for it. Right. It's kind of bogus, but that, I'm a little bit biased on this one. Um, is there, which, is there, uh is there like a room or discretion like in an extradition case to say what you're talking about, that this is a, a political or a sham prosecution? Um, so you can think of an example in Venezuela where the Venezuelan authorities might say we want certain evidence, et cetera, from the U.S. In, in that situation, would there be room for an individual to say, look, this is a sham? I mean, I know in extradition cases, uh, if you can show it's a political crime, um, you might have some leverage to have it. Uh, put aside? Is there? Is there? Well, you can challenge identity of the person. For example, that we had a case where someone claimed you got the the, the brother. Is my brother is the bad guy? My twin brother. Uh, okay. Not me. <laughs> it's pretty good. Uh, uh, but what do you think? I mean, you're 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 in the government now. So I, I mean, it's a good question. I've seen it in the extradition context. In the MLAT context that I'm working in, our matters are all sealed. So um, private parties, unless it's the internet service provider, we're in a world where we have Facebook, Google. Apple, Dropbox, all of those entities are here in the Northern District. So they sometimes will push back on what the federal government's trying to get, but other private parties here don't know what we're doing because the matters are all sealed. And can I, I, I think it's important to distinguish there's, for the MLATs, there's outgoing and incoming, mm -hmm. right? So outgoing is the U.S. requesting evidence from abroad. Incoming is a foreign government requesting evidence from here. If it's the U.S. government requesting evidence from a foreign country, and you're in a criminal case and you represent a criminal defendant, and so I'm talking from the defense perspective, um, at least some judges, if the government's seeking evidence in a foreign country, they'll look at the prosecutor and say, you got to let the defense interview witnesses too, under Brady. And, and so you can pressure the district court judge to allow defense witnesses to be interviewed abroad um, pursuant to an MLAT request, even though technically you're not allowed to make the request under an MLAT. On the um, incoming requests, if it's, and they can be either for documents or testimony, if it's for testimony on the incoming requests, if it's for a witness who is someone you're familiar with or maybe you have a joint defense arrangement with them, that witness can raise objections like I have a Fifth Amendment privilege, I have a privilege under the law of the foreign government. So there's different ways that um, either the witness themselves or a third party can sort of intervene in the process. On the outgoing side, even though you put your stuff under seal, you can't guarantee that it's under seal in the foreign country. And so you can have people on the ground in the foreign country that can go to the files in Switzerland or wherever and say, oh, what's the federal government looking for here? So there's there's ways uh, from a defense perspective to get information from the process or intervene in the process to your advantage. Yeah, and I think that's an important point, right? That you don't lose your constitutional rights. 
in the U.S. just because of foreign governments requesting something in the sense that you're allowed to, you know, raise your usual, um, you know, usual objections if you're being uh, interviewed. You know, you can take five or, or what have you, which, again, you become, a, as an AUSA, you become a commissioner. It sounds very, I remember being very honored to be a commissioner for the, whatever, Metropolitan Tokyo or something like that, mm -hmm. you know, letter with, like, a lot of little ribbons on it and so forth. And then you go forth and find, kind of gather information uh, uh, with subpoenas and otherwise. But so that's, Basically, the the M light and a very brief summary. We actually, um, uh, I know you know this plugging books thing is great. You know, I mean it. it uh, but I did a thing for, for free for the Federal Judicial Center, and you can go online and find it for free. Thus, no residuals for me. Um, uh, uh, a book on MLATs and mutual uh, and, and letters rogatory that is sort of a guide for judges, so all the federal judges. In the old days, they get these little little Sorry. blue books. Now it's all online. But but so that if you if you're interested, you can point out. Frankly, all the things I got wrong, which I'm sure there there are plenty of them in there, but uh, but there's that there's that resource if if that's what you want to call it. Um, then we have letters rogatory, which is available to all parties uh, in the sense that it's available to criminal in criminal cases and civil cases. It's essentially a letter to a judge in the foreign jurisdiction saying, "Hey, help me out here." Um, and often it's ours are often routed through Office of International Affairs. All MLATs are routed through essentially diplomatic channels. Technically, a foreign judge could write a U.S. judge with a request, and it happens. Technically, a person could write a U.S. judge and say, hey, uh, I'd like you to help me with this. Um, it's a lot, it's a lot little, from, from my perspective, a little less streamlined uh, than the MLAT process. Um, uh, it also is uh, less reliable and takes longer uh, than the MLAT process. Uh, there are foreign governments that we help uh, rather extensively who don't help us rather extensively. And so there is a lot of pressures. We have some programs, even sort of in the RLA context, where, where we help certain foreign governments establish their responsiveness, set up a little office so that they can process US MLAT requests, so they can kind of give back a little. Uh, but letters rogatory are very, at least, and this is what I'm very curious about what you guys all think. In my experience, are very, um, Again, it's your only avenue, formal avenue, other than the, the informal go to the judge, sort of, and say, hey, have these guys help me out a little bit. Um, but it's your only kind of avenue for formally gathering evidence from abroad. The reality, of course, is, especially as the RLAs know, a lot of this is handled over you know, a cocktail and, and, and you have a conversation with a foreign government. I mean, there are reasons why you have delegates from foreign governments, prosecutors, uh, uh, investigators come over to the U.S. and vice versa. We, there's a, a very heavy social network of people who just can call each other up and say, hey, here's my request, and you follow it up with an MLAT request, or you follow it up with a letter of rogatory, as, as the case may be. But again, private practitioners, or rather private parties, letters of rogatory are really your, your only um, formal avenue for gathering uh, uh, evidence, and that goes federal and state courts, right? You can, it doesn't matter, they don't distinguish between federal and state courts. Um, and are, they're essentially the judges who issue the opinion, although, or rather the request, although they're facilitated um, uh, by the courts. But I'm curious what you guys, because letters rogatory always to me, both in the government and in private practice, and also writing this book, you know, kind of were a little bit more mysterious, frankly, in terms of how they're done. Because I've seen them come in in all sorts of different ways. I'm curious if you guys have more experience than I do in, in terms of sort of seeing these things come and go. So I, what are your thoughts on letter rogatory? So they, I, I used to have Maureen's job at the U.S. Attorney's Office, and we, we, we did a few of them. They're very slow and very cumbersome. They're, it's basically rather than a... MLATs go through DOJs, a DOJ or a Ministry of Justice. They don't go through the courts, technically. A letter rogatory goes from one court to another court. Um, and so they're much slower and they're much more cumbersome. Um, you have to get your judge to issue it, and then it goes through the State Department, goes to some foreign judge, and then they and then they do whatever they do on their end. But even on the MLATs, a lot of times they'll go to the foreign judge if it's for testimony in particular, but they're very cumbersome. And, and that's, it, I mean, the key thing, right? MLATs. Treaty well, there's based. the Hague Convention in civil right. cases if you want right. to get evidence under the Hague and, Convention. And, and they, they're, they're issued as a matter of treaty obligations. Uh, letters rogatory are, are as a matter of comedy, uh, IT, not ED. Um, and those are, those are basically just a great, you know, because on the, the good graces of a foreign court to grant them if and when they feel like it. So well, I've had them come in through the same process that I get the MLATs from. I've had letter rogatories come in through mm -hmm. DC and end up in my office. 
they do seem more jumbled because the way other judges put things together sometimes uses all the old formalities and then it's translated into English. So you're reading it and it, it probably takes an hour just to understand what they're asking for. And um, we in the United States want to have a good relationship with most foreign countries. So um, I've seen them come from every country you can imagine, every country you can think of, small countries, big countries. And I really have only seen that Canada is phenomenal. You get a Canadian mutual legal assistant request and you sit back and relax because it's beautifully written, it's understandable, the law's laid out. Then we put together our search warrants or whatever the Canadians are asking for and we can turn it around. And then there are other countries that I will not name because it just seems wrong to do that. But you get them and you think, and it's not the countries that you would expect. I'll throw France under the bus. I got one from France and I thought, I had to look a couple of times to make sure it was actually from France where we actually have a DOJ legat um, because it was almost incomprehensible what the crime was and what they were asking for. Um, but the letter of rogatories just do seem a little bit more like quarterly written requests for information and then we do our best to ask for them because what I found out over the years happens back in DC is if there's a country that we want something for, we've been requesting the extradition of a particular individual or information in a particularly important case and they've been doing the same with us. When there's a meeting every year or so, um, people that are familiar with those stacks of requests on both sides sit down and they say, well, you have an extradition for a man who uh, attempted murder in Oakland, California, and it's been nine years we've been trying to get him. And your courts have been sitting on it. You want this person in Mexico, well, then you need to move. And there's this, you know, carefully negotiated horse trade that happens. We'll get that done, we'll give you this. There's some of that behind the scenes. Yeah, a big difference, too, between the two is that in MLATs, there's a central authority. And the central authorities deal with each other almost daily. And so you're gonna get your MLAT request much more quickly. And also the MLAT also have, at the end of the MLATs, they even have forms. So in terms of getting something admitted into evidence, you can just use the form on the MLAT, whereas letters of rotatory, you don't have that. That's right, and we have, uh, again, a little plug here in, in, in the uh, Federal Judicial Center uh, manual, there's sort of a, 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 a kind of a pony or a sample that you can uh, use to follow as to, you know, what the, the types of information that are sought and sort of structure of a, of a letter rogatory. And, and of course, uh, at the risk of stating the obvious, when we say there's 60 some countries with whom we have treaties under the MLAT process, if you're doing your math, there are a couple more countries in the world. So a lot of countries you don't have treaties with for a whole number of reasons, but you can still send a, a, a little love letter over to their courts and see if something comes back. But, but in any event, and of course, again, shameless plug, this is a, a lovely book, Oxford Press. Margaret McEwen wrote an awesome foreword, Judge Margaret McEwen, um, from Bakshish to Bribery, and, and you know, as a smart uh, uh, or semi-smart white collar, the defense attorney, I of course reprint, re just to make up some space, the entire Federal Judicial Center handbook in here as an appendix material. So uh, feel free to paste yeah. if, you, if you don't want it's it for like free. Um, <laughs> but in any event, so thanks very much and I'll look forward to hearing what my distinguished panelists have to say. Great, okay, so we're gonna turn it over to Maureen um, to get uh, in a little more detail on the MLAT request and how it works, the mechanisms behind it. So one of the things that's uh, started to happen probably over the last 10 years is that the requests from around the world when a crime happens um, to the United States through the MLAT process for detailed information is the cyber world has opened up prosecutors, opportunities. At the same time, criminals are using uh, digital evidence to commit all sorts of crimes from bribery to public corruption to murders. Um, prosecutors have turned it around and are now seeking that evidence. And lots of that evidence lies here again in the Northern District because of the service providers we have. So for example, there was a homicide that took place in a small European country that's an island. And I'm going to keep some of the details out of this because the work is all under seal. But the person um, was found dead, a woman, and she was wearing a Fitbit. Um, so the prosecutors started collecting evidence on this person and they decided they wanted the information on the Fitbit. Years and years ago, the MLAT process took forever to get from point A in, let's just say, Ireland, 
to from the prosecutor to their central authority, their attorney general, um, Ministry of Justice, through to the State Department in the United States, then over to our attorney general, and then to a prosecutor sitting somewhere. It might, that process might take two years. Um, if that was still the case, the prosecutor would just go ahead without digital evidence because it's gonna take forever to get the information they're seeking before the trial. In this particular case, they, um, everything's moving actually very quickly because OIA, the Office of International Affairs in DC, has put a prosecutor in our district and funds it, so we do it full time. And they ask for, this foreign country asks for the information on this Fitbit to see if they could learn anything about the person. And what they found was that um, they had an approximate time of death. Her body was found floating in the water, but they estimated a time of death. When they got back the information from Fitbit, it was fantastic evidence for the prosecutor. The person's heart rate was going along just fine, and then it accelerated, and then it stopped. But the person's body moved. So this was information the prosecutor ended up using in their prosecution of the boyfriend, along with all sorts of other evidence they collected. So how did they get that evidence from us? So I just sort of gave a preliminary. They go through their process from their central authority, which is generally speaking their uh, attorney general, through their international department, like the State Department, and then it comes and does the same thing with us, and it ends up on a desk of someone like me, a prosecutor, federal prosecutor. I work closely with an FBI agent. I put together a search warrant, like we do typical search warrants. Has anyone in the audience done search warrants? Just getting a sense, yes. So put together the facts, what do we have? What is probable cause that this evidence is going to reveal um, evidence about this murder? So we put the facts together as best we know and we lay out what the laws are. If it's a treaty, if it's not a treaty, we're doing it for comedy purposes. We want to get information from them because they're gonna get, give us information. Um, and submit it to our magistrate judges. This isn't justice being able to do this without checks and balances, the courts check it. Courts read it, a magistrate judge will d decide whether or not we've actually um, spelled out probable cause that on this woman's Fitbit, we're going to get evidence of the murder. And once they sign off on it, the search warrant is served on Fitbit by the FBI agent. It's all done you know, through emails. And then the evidence is given back to the FBI, it's screened, it goes through and back over to the foreign requester. So when you sit back for a moment and think, what information is on my cell phone right now? I'd never really thought about it as extensively as I have in the last year because you don't think about things like which one of my apps has GPS? So many of them do. Okay, so, and it's the rare criminal, rare person who will go on here, even if they've committed a crime, and, and stop the, um, you know, shut it off, shut off the app. The phone has it, your Gmail account, your Facebook, everything on here separately is taking down information about you. And so, you know, finally for prosecutors, it's fantastic, especially because we actually move these things. We'll get a request in and we'll respond to it within a few months. So, um, you know, crimes are mostly now committed. I'd have to say the two biggest um, internet service providers, Facebook, for some reason, everyone who commits crimes then talks about it or messages someone. And then someone who assaults or rapes or molests someone then sends messages like, I'm so sorry I did that to you last night, are we still friends? That's all fantastic fingerprint evidence of the crimes and prosecutors worldwide now are aware of that and want it. So that's been my role along with working on extraditions and you heard that we also become commissioners. So the commissioner is actually a really interesting way to gather information. If someone here, I had a case where um, a murder was committed and the person here in the United States had also, they had fled from you know, a foreign country, let's say Australia, and with all sorts of evidence of the crime, like the person they killed, their credit cards and other things, and people sometimes just don't think, then use the credit cards here in the United States. And so that foreign country, let's say Australia then, does a request that gets to us fairly quickly. We, an AUSA, becomes a commissioner, files in magistrate court. Um, we'd like to get this evidence, lay out what the foreign request is, lay out what the evidence is, and then our agents will actually go and do a search warrant here in the United States, interview witnesses, gather that, excuse me, gather that information. And this is usually at an investigative stage, so the defense attorneys 
from my experience so far, not yet involved. The person has not yet been charged. And then that evidence is gathered up and shipped back off to the authorities. At the same time, um, in this particular case, the foreign requester asked for the individual's extradition. So the evidence was gathered and then they were extradited. So the, um, the cyber world that I'm working in right now is really phenomenal. I mean, people move at light speed to move money through bitcoins and, um, and mostly communicate through things like WhatsApp and Facebook and Gmail. And that's all trackable for the most part. There are a number of qualifiers, but I, I won't go into that. So Can I? So um, the example that you gave with the Fitbit, you get the request uh, from the requesting state, and then uh, you, you basically work with an FBI agent. You put together a search warrant. That obviously is through the American judicial system. So it goes through the, the same process it would if it was domestic once you received the request, right? That's right. So I remember, and again, this is going back some time, but um, uh, there was a, uh, I acted for an individual who had uh, been subject to an MLAT request from Belgium. So there was a bilateral treaty, uh, MLAT treaty between Canada and Belgium. And in that case, um, what they asked for and what they uh, were successful, uh, this was before my involvement in the case, but what they were successful in obtaining was an order to have an actual judicial inquiry of the uh, of the witness of, of who eventually became the defendant. So this courtroom in downtown Toronto, for all intents and purposes, became part of Belgium for three or four hours. The person is brought in and, and uh, they say, look, under Belgian law, uh, you know, our, we're a civil law system and our judges are allowed to make inquiries. And that's exactly what happens through a video conference. And I always wondered, um, is, there, is there a conflict of law situation? Because in, in Canada, you would have the right to remain silent, right? So you'd be able to say, well, you, you can't ask me these, which uh, Martha's going to talk about, but you can't ask me these questions, right? So it's interesting. I've had a number of those requests come in. Spain had an investigation, and they wanted to interview someone here. I've had, uh, so they set up a three-judge panel, and we uh, communicated with the individual. In my case, they were a witness, but they could be a target depending on what they said. They came in, they had an attorney. Um, I communicated with the attorney. And they came in and they answered the questions of the Spanish court. In my understanding, I mean, they have due process rights because they're in the United States. It's different than extraditions. But um, they answered all of the questions and the Spanish court gathered the evidence. And I've, I've done the reverse. I've gone to Taiwan where we had two targets and a significant amount of evidence and I went through the MLAT process and they let us go over but they were very clear it was going to be the Taiwanese prosecutor who was going to be answering asking the questions of the target and it was an uncomfortable weird situation because I wondered in Taiwan they do have the right to ask them but here obviously we give someone they have the right under the Fifth Amendment not to answer questions that are going to incriminate them and then the Taiwanese prosecutor, because we were translating and going through a process, I was able to write questions beyond the ones that had already been approved. And in my mind, I just assumed anything we gathered from that was for information purposes only, and we would not be able to use it against them in the United States if the person was ever extradited. And that, you know, I, I looked for cases, and I know you've got two cases here, and I just assumed that was going to be what would happen at the end of the day. If the person was extradited and we were going to prosecute them here in the United States, I would not be able to use their compelled testimony from Taiwan, even though it was gathered legally there. Uh, do you agree with that? Yeah, I mean, it, it, it really depends on what you're talking about, I mean, in terms of what process is being used. But, but if, if you're talking about an MLAT request and it's incoming, so a foreign government wants to interview a person here in the United States, if it's a U.S. person here in the United States and a foreign government wants to interview them, the person here in the United States has a Fifth Amendment privilege if they're threatened by U.S. prosecution, not if they're threatened by foreign prosecution, but if they're threatened by U.S. prosecution, they can invoke their Fifth Amendment and not and refuse to testify. But if they do that, you could go get a, a, a judicial immunity order and now compel the U.S. citizen to provide testimony for a foreign proceeding. Flip side, if now you want to go to a foreign country and you want um, a uh, witness over there, and they have a Fifth Amendment privilege under their law, they can invoke it. There's nothing you can do at that point to compel them. If the foreign government's not going to compel them, you're, you're stuck with it. So 
it depends on you know which way you're going. Is it coming in or, or going out, and and whose privilege is being invoked? I mean the. The more interesting question is if it's a U.S. person here, say they have a bank account in Switzerland, which wouldn't, you don't have this anymore, but say you have a bank account in Switzerland and someone wants to interview you here and you say, ah, oh, I, I have a bank secrecy privilege and I don't want to talk about my bank accounts, can they invoke that or not? I don't know. I would say try. But, but then um, they might freeze your bank account. <laughs> uh, who knows? Right. Yeah. I mean, it right. depends on who's asking and who's got control and all of that. But. Um, well, Tyler, I mean, you're widely renowned as the <laughs> number one investigator at the World Bank. Yes. Uh, is, I mean, and this is sort of an ignorant question because I fully understand the World Bank is not a country and so forth, but to what extent does the World Bank either it, it receive sort of requests indirectly to, to commanding them to do certain things or trying to, or, or I mean, you, your evidence gathering, does it ever, is there ever any intersection with, with either letters rogatory or the World Bank? Right, so, uh, so we have, um, we enjoy privileges and immunities basically for the signatory countries. I think there's 188 or 190 of them, which allows us to go into those countries and investigate. Uh, if we have audit rights, we basically, it's the mm -hmm. equivalent of a, of a compelled statement. Um, and then often what will happen is in the course of our investigations, we will come across evidence uh, of uh, um, violation of a national law. And then we, we have the um, discretion to refer that to the mm -hmm. national authorities. Uh, but then um, it becomes a situation very similar to what uh, I think Martha is going to talk about in the Allen case, where you know you, you have, uh, uh, in theory, you're, you have the compel the, the World Bank can compel you to come in on an interview and answer questions in an audit, but you may be facing proceedings in which you'd want to take the fifth or, or obviously not answer those questions, and that conflict of law is something that really hasn't been resolved. The other way that it happens is that. A lot of times when the World Bank does an investigation, majority of the cases are, are resolved through a settlement where the party admits it did something wrong and then the World Bank decides what sanction to do. Then what happens is sometimes the aggrieved people bring a civil action, as happened in Canada yes. when there was a, a bribe uh, in an infrastructure project, I think it was in Bangladesh. So the, 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 the shareholders brought an action against the officers and directors, and they asked the judge to compel the World Bank to turn over the documents that showed the wrongdoing. Um, but the World Bank's procedures say, you know, the, the, those documents are confidential. Um, so I, I was hired as an expert witness, and the other side got an expert witness, and the judge in the end said, well, I don't know if I want to demand that the World Bank send me these documents because I know it's important for the World Bank to be able to, you know, settle cases without, you know, having a long, drawn-out procedure, and so I don't want to, you know, interfere with that. Right, right. But, like but, but now the World Bank increasingly is deciding on more transparency. I mean, step by step. In theory, trying to, trying to. What, one of the things I, I wanted to discuss quickly before we left MLATS behind, uh, one of my favorite cases, and Marcus, you can talk about this, is the uh, US and Chong, which is the, versus Chong, the, with a J, the, the South Korean case from the Fifth Circuit. This was a case just to, uh, I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with it or not, but it's a remarkable case. And if I get the facts right, you correct me if I'm wrong. It's uh, um, Mr. Chong was a telecommunications provider for a U.S. Uh, Army base in South Korea. And he bribed uh, U.S. Army officials to get the contract. And um, there's an investigation by the South Korean authorities. Uh, he actually ultimately pleads guilty and goes to jail in South Korea for bribing uh, American uh, pub uh, public officials, army members. The U.S. Um, uh, sends an MLAT request through a treaty it has with South Korea, and it says in the MLAT request, look, we're aware that you've already prosecuted, convicted Mr. Uh, Chong. We're not, um, we're not seeking this information in order to further prosecute him, but of course he bribed U.S. military personnel, and we would like this evidence to consider whether or not we want to issue or start a prosecution against them. 
So the South Korean government gives the information over pursuant to the MLAT request. When Mr. Chong gets out of jail, uh, he is still owed money by the U.S. government. When the U.S. government says, yeah, that's fine, why don't you just take a plane and come on over to Texas and we'll talk about what we owe you. And of course, when he lands in Texas, he is arrested and charged for what's essentially the same conduct. And part of his argument uh, in the South Korean government uh, intervenes amicus and says, look, this is, is you can't, it's got to be an abusive process to, to uh, prosecute me because right in the MLAT request, it says, we won't prosecute this guy. We, you know, we understand that you've already prosecuted him. And the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeal says, well, it's just guidance because in the bilateral treaty, it says the two authorities will, uh, I can't remember if it, the word was, um, they'll consult. I think it's that they can, they'll consult with each other, but the fact that the U.S. government, in, in my humble opinion, completely misrepresented what it would do with the evidence was found to not be an impediment to prosecute him. So he was prosecuted and went to jail in the U.S. for the same conduct. Well, it's also important to note we don't have double je international double jeopardy. So in other words, if you're in London or in England and, uh, and there's this case in the same facts where the person already was convicted in the U.S., you can't, you know, you can't take another shot at, at him or her. Um, and Andrew Boutros and I did a University of Chicago uh, law review article on what we term uh, carbon copy prosecutions. It talks about that particular thing a little bit. Um, whereas the U.S. doesn't have that. So we can, you know, you could put a person in jail for as long as you want somewhere else and we'll take another shot at him if we want to, if it's just and appropriate. Um, I'm not surprised by that result, by the way. Uh, uh, I understand that, you know, from a diplomatic perspective, maybe the U.S. is going to have a harder time getting some cooperation from the South Koreans going forward, but it doesn't affect the, the, the accuracy, the reliability of the evidence. The evidence is what it is. It's not, you know, the U.S. didn't give it through, through torturing the person. I mean, it is what it is. The fact that there is a, 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 a screw-up or a misrepresentation I mean, again, I'm sounding like I'm mm. in my old job here, but uh, <laughs> uh, but I, I don't know. Like when I just hear it, and, and I'm not as familiar with the facts mm. as you are, but it, it doesn't offend my my sensibilities. And I, and the result, if it was other, if there was a technical violation of the MLAT process, and that would result in the, in, in the inability of the U.S. government or any, to use the evidence at all, I think that'd be a strange result. But but again, I may be a minority of one on this. Wouldn't be mm. first time. But but it, but it just it doesn't. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. I'm hoping it was a misstatement by someone who was in one part of the Justice Department that didn't know what the other people were doing because it does offend me a little bit. I mean, I would hate to put something in a request to a country um, and say, you know, when we just asked for Assange and WikiLeaks to be um, extradited here and then, he, you know, we can only charge him with what we're putting in those initial extradition papers that we're sending abroad. We can't change it and then add something that includes the death penalty. So, I mean, I would hope right. we would never do that because it makes us look bad in the world and then people don't trust us, so. Well, that's, I mean, I, I totally get that. I mean, that's from a, from, from sort of a policy perspective. I mean, look, we, we're technically allowed to lie to a defendant, right? Oh, we found your fingerprints, what do you say about that? <laughs> uh, oh my gosh, you did? Okay, I, I did it. And then later it turns out we never had the fingerprints. There's nothing unconstitutional about that. So why can't we just tell another country, oh, we're not gonna use that evidence? I mean, that seems to me less, <laughs> less well, <laughs> offensive and I mean former. right you could change your mind obviously as it goes forward but um, one of the things one I don't know the answer to this because I, I'm just not familiar enough with the MLAB process but I found that it was a bit unusual to to specify that in the MLAB request would you normally do that would you normally say we're not going to give us this evidence we won't prosecute this guy so or? I do the incoming ones and the outgoing ones I've done before I've never represented that I'm not going to prosecute them because my whole representation is that we are going to prosecute them and we need right. this evidence to do so I, right I mm -hmm. assume it's just mostly in death penalty cases where other countries are opposed to the death penalty so then you would say no we're not going to prosecute right you know right a lot of you have to like in, in Irish law if we get a request from the US it has to say that either the information is required for investigation or for prosecution right. purposes. Right. So it actually seems like something that would have been by mistake, unless there was something peculiar for the South Korean agent. Because if that request came to Ireland, mm -hmm. it would have to be refused by the Department of Justice. It would even get to the judge stage. Because if you knew that it wasn't good, it was only being asked for by the US authorities for information mm -hmm. purposes, it could not get to actually gather the evidence under a production order or over a witness. 
it's, it just, it seems a very peculiar situation. Right. Well, to, just to clarify, my recollection of the facts, and I don't have the case in front of me, was that the U.S. was saying, look, you know, we might potentially prosecute the bribe takers, the bribe receivers from the U.S. Army. So we're not going to, we're not going to prosecute, but they do specify, this I do remember, they say we will not prosecute the bribe giver, the person that, you know, has already been, and I just, that, that part of it seemed unusual to me to, to specify at that point in time who you will and who you won't prosecute. Let's say if, if South Korea goes back and says, give you the information, we're only giving it to people pertaining that you have specified. Yes. Well, and that's why, that's why, for instance, on Irish law, if, if there's a head of from the US or many other country, we only send back the information on the basis of the known pertaining that the person, if they're ever tried, the prosecutor would have mm -hmm. the opportunity to challenge that mm -hmm. evidence at trial. Okay. So we require what's known as a break overtaking. Okay. That arose in a case in our Irish Supreme Court. Said, the Supreme Court said we're not we're not allowing anything to cause any other country unless they get an overtaking that that tier can be challenged at trial. Interesting. So if the country requires an overtaking that might make it different from a treaty uh, position. And here so it's Right. Here it could have been that there was concerns from the South Korean. There's, there are times a formal request comes in, and then there's a lot of emails that go back and forth between our Department of Justice and the prosecutors. And at times there'll be opinions that go back and forth. Well, listen, we're very concerned. Our guys already spent five, eight, ten years in prison. We don't want them to go to the U.S., Texas of all places, and end up in, in custody there for 40 years on this. And I can see a prosecutor at Maine Justice saying, no, 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 we're, this is for the, we have no intent to do that. This is just for the um, bribe takers. Right. And then... You know, someone in Texas decides this is a great prosecution. We have all this wonderful evidence, and maybe they don't even know what was said in the um, MLAT that went back and forth. Well, and maybe the evidence was not, I mean, you know, Venn diagram, right? I mean, you know, I'm, I'm, you're effectively, effectively giving immunity to the person, right? We're not going to prosecute if you right. give us this evidence. Right. For all we know, the Texas authorities, I mean, I'm just playing mm -hmm. devil's advocate here, yeah. but for all we know, the Texas authorities feel or have uh, separate evidence, additional mm -hmm. evidence, stronger evidence, and they say, well, sure. we're not going to use it exclusively. Again, it goes mm -hmm. into the language. But I agree, I have not seen it, other than the death penalty, right? We'll, we'll say, okay, we want this person, we want this evidence, we'll give it to you, but not if you're going to seek the death penalty, we're going to send them over, but not if we're going to execute them for drug offense or whatever. That's where you see the, the kind of the, the contingent nature of these MLAT requests. But um, but again, you know, remember our exclusionary rules are in America are not the world's rules. I mean, in a lot of countries, Germany, for example, if a police officer screws something up, you don't get to like the murder weapon doesn't get excluded. You you go out, you you, you get the police officer fired. Some would say that's a more mm -hmm. sensible approach. Um, so if you follow that logic through, you can see why you wouldn't necessarily dump the whole case. Uh, just because someone, uh, some bureaucrat screwed something up, mm -hmm. which wouldn't, again, be the first time that happens. Right. Either. And years before the prosecution. Yeah. Right. So, right. Yes. The other element that you mentioned was that the United States then induced the person in the context of the civil case to yes. say, why don't you come over here? Yes. Uh, and therefore, uh, you know, more explicitly uh, use the first statement in order to induce somebody to come here. Seems to me that adds another level, a troubling level. Yes. Well, we do that all the time. And that's legal. <laughs> to, to lure someone into the country is completely legal to then arrest yeah. them for criminal yeah, yeah. purposes. That's fine and it's, it is frequently done. We have to get extra approval at the Department of Justice to do it, but it's legitimate. Yeah, we, there was a case down in St. Louis where the government, um, we uh, uh, basically set up a, a, a company that got hacked by, by a hacker. The company was created by the government, so it made it very easy for the hacker. It kind of said, hey, hacker, you might want to check out this company. He hacks in. We say, wow, you're great at hacking in. We, we would love to hire you as a security expert. We'll pay you a million dollars a year. Come on to, come on to St. Louis, and we'll hook you up real good. <laughs> and, and we did. Uh, yeah. Mm. yeah. But the lying, you know, that, again, it, 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 it's not nice, but. Mm. Mm. Sure. relation to the possibility of material being deleted before the mm -hmm. evidence through the system. So is, is there anything or anything being thought of as a kind of supernatural level of kind of preservation orders? You know, you know a formal request is on the way that it hasn't arrived yet. 
tell Facebook or, or Fitness, can you preserve that material? So it seems to me the countries that are active, and Ireland is incredibly active in this MLAT world, they know about it. They know, for everyone else here that doesn't know what he's talking about, if you're a prosecutor in Ireland and there's been a crime and you want to get evidence here, the first thing you do is send a preservation letter, a very simple letter to Google or Facebook or whoever you want the evidence from saying, preserve this evidence. And the internet service provider will. They'll freeze it. And then it takes you um, a month to get your MLAT request through and then down to the United States or over to the United States and then we gather whatever's been preserved from Google. If you don't preserve it, and that international process takes a little bit of time, it's gone. But if you preserve it and then the criminal goes and deletes it from their phone or their cloud or whatever it is, you still have it. Is that being done by the companies on this side of the Atlantic as kind of, on a kind of a good grace, you know, as a, it's, you know. Are they preserving it? They preserve it on the basis that look, they know the request is on the way or, or is there a, a legal basis? I think it's a legal basis. If it's if there's a preservation request, they have to freeze it. I don't think I don't think there is a legal. I think they do it as a matter because really? if there's a if there's a preservation request from a foreign government, I don't know what law in this country. If there's a litigation and you're informed that there's litigation, civil litigation in the U.S., you have a duty to preserve. But I don't know if you just get a request from some foreign government that that would trigger that legal duty. If it be I binding. think it might create lots of problems, though, with the federal government yeah. here if um, internet service providers were not freezing that information and they knew it right. was Right. No, evidence but they, all, all I'm saying is they sure, as a matter of okay. prudence, okay. I would, okay. you know, if I got a request, I'd say, oh, yeah, I'll Sorry. preserve that because I don't want to risk it. I'm just mm -hmm. saying I'm not sure that there's any real concrete legal duty. So if they didn't for some reason, I don't know that you could sue them or charge them or anything. I'll have to look at the next letter. Um, some countries that are smaller and I think have less use of the MLET process send letters directly to Google and say we really want this evidence for our case and then there's a letter back to them saying you have to go through the MLAT process first you're going to want a preservation request then you're going to need to go through and they give them a little outline so I mean it seems like everyone's acting for the most part in very good faith here Can I just... I want to quickly mention, I mean, we've been talking about MLATs, and I'm on the defense side. All of this relates to the government, if you're a prosecutor or the police or whatever. But there is, there's a provision under U.S. law, section 1782, that allows, if I'm under investigation in Switzerland, I'm a Swiss citizen, I can get a 1782 petition and go to Google and say, I would like to get, you know, the same data that the Swiss government may be asking for. So there's, there's not just government-to-government -government requests. You can, as a civil... Uh, or a criminal defendant in a foreign country, there's ways you can essentially do the same thing if you're over there. Um, and I just think people should remember that depending on what your facts and situations. So this would be a good segue to move to the Cloud Act, um, which was uh, came about obviously from servers in Ireland, I believe, if I remember correctly. Exactly. Yeah. So um, I'm going to discuss both the 
the fact that in March of 2018, uh, the U.S. enacted the Clarifying Lawful Overseas Use of Data Act, uh, known as the Cloud Act, um, and which helped clarify the um, Stored Communications Act, um, and it all arose out of the Microsoft case. So what happened in uh, the Microsoft case in 2000, 2013 is that uh, the U.S. was prosecuting or investigating a, a drug case um, where the defendant was using Hotmail, Hotmail account, and because the individual with a Hotmail account was, an, was living in Ireland, uh, Microsoft uh, kept the data in, in Ireland. So when, uh, when Microsoft was served with a, a warrant under the Stored Communications Act, Microsoft said, okay, here's the subscriber information, but we can't give you any more because that information is in Ireland and you gotta use an MLAT if you want that. And the prosecutor said, what do you mean? The data might be there, but Microsoft is right here. And Microsoft can, Microsoft has control, custody, and possession. So there's no extraterritoriality. Microsoft should hand it over. Um, and uh, the district court agreed, but the Second Circuit reversed and, and held that the law was really a privacy law and that it looked like the, the presumption against extraterritoriality should apply and that therefore, um, you know, it, it, um, it reversed. So it went in bank and then it went to the Supreme Court and you wouldn't believe all the amicus that were filed. I mean, there were amicus filed by the EU, by the Irish, uh, government by about 30 uh, electronic uh, discovery organizations, by the ACLU and all kinds of civil liberty unions, um, etc. Et but before the Supreme Court could determine the case, lo and behold, Congress acted uh, with with the Cloud Act, and the first part clarified that electronic providers must comply with an order under the Stored Communications Act to disclose emails even where they're held outside the US. And the second part governs foreign government's access to US held data. And that authorizes the US to conclude reciprocal data sharing executive agreements with foreign governments. And it went through all kinds of requirements on the eligibility for the foreign governments. They have to, in order to conclude one of these agreements, the U.S. has to decide that the foreign governments have laws that afford robust substantive and procedural protections for privacy and civil liberties in light of the data collection and activities of the foreign government that will be subject to the agreement. They have to have um, appropriate procedures to minimize the acquisition, retention, and dissemination of the information concerning U.S. persons. Um, and they also have, have to have procedures that guard against targeting um, either a U.S. citizen or person in the U.S. Um, and also in order to qualify for the, the, for the disclosure of U.S. held data the foreign government has to meet various conditions, such as uh, the, they have to be trying to obtain the information either to prevent, investigate, or uh, prosecute serious crime, um, and they have to identify a specific person um, or a specific identifier as the object of the order. They have to comply with their own domestic law, and their law has to be subject to independent oversight. Um, and they have to agree to periodic review of their procedures. Um, and so, and then every five years it's up for review. So essentially, if they meet all these conditions, then the foreign government can 
go directly to the U.S. service provider and obtain the information. Uh, but there, there are also procedures where the U.S. service provider can try to object, although the Cloud Act doesn't give a lot of the procedural um, information about how that works. Um, maybe it's because they, you know, did it so quickly. Mm -hmm. um, Has there been any agreement signed so far? Good question. The answer is, even though it's now been over a year, no. The U.S. and, and the U.K. have been negotiating, and, you know, it's said that soon after the, the, the U.K. leaves the E.U., that they're going to do it. But, you know, as the commentator in the back has mentioned, um, you know, one of, the big, one of the big issues is the EU has much more stringent privacy data protection. I mean, the, the GDPR. Um, and, you know, the, the, systems, the systems are different. I mean, in fact, the, the, the U.S., and the EU Justice and Home Affairs ministers, they meet on a regular basis. And for the last couple of years, at every meeting, they talk about, you know, the, the, the issues for electronic um, uh, data cooperation. Um, so, for instance, if a pro provider can show that it reasonably, reasonably believes that the customer or subscriber is not a U.S. person and does not reside in the U.S. and that disclosure would cause a material risk, the provider would, would violate laws of a qualifying foreign government, the provider can obtain relief. And then there's uh, a seven-factor comedy analysis on balancing the interests of justice where a court has to determine um, whether or not to compel the service provider to disclose. So, and one question is, does the Cloud Act apply to non-U.S. service providers? And it appears that in order to apply, the U.S. has to have jurisdiction. So there's going to be some kind of a, um, a decision by the court on whether there is jurisdiction, whether this non-U.S. service provider is doing enough in the U.S. jurisdiction uh, to be subject to this law. Um, but that also means that if you're a criminal and you want to, you know, do a series of acts and you don't want, that's going to involve the Internet and you don't want the U.S. to have jurisdiction, then you pick a service provider who's not doing business in the U.S., um, and that's going to help you. In, in addition, some countries have laws that say um, that, there's, that, that the service provider can't keep the information. They use a data trust, and the law provides that only the trustee of the data has possession control and custody, and therefore, if a foreign court compels the electronic service providers to comply, they can't do it under, under local law. So there's still, you know, conflicts of law. So just on that, on that point of whether or not there's a sufficient nexus to, for the U.S. to take jurisdiction, I'm thinking of the FCPA cases. I know they're service providers, but the nexus seems so minimal Right for, for most kind of anti-bribery, anti-corruption cases, it's an email or a fax that comes in the U.S., use of the U.S. banking system. Does the legislation speak to uh, when there would be a, a sufficient nexus for the U.S. to take jurisdiction? It doesn't. No, it does okay. not. It does not. And, and, and the U.S. Department of Justice just in April of this year put out about a 30-page paper, a white paper, on the Cloud Act. And, and it has a series of 29 frequently asked questions, and, and a couple of those have to do with jurisdiction. And they say, you know, there's no specific answer except the answer is whether the service provider 
is doing enough, is purpose, purposefully availing itself of U.S. jurisdiction, just like in, mm -hmm. you know, the, the international shoe case. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, and I think one of the reasons the DOJ put out the white paper is because it hasn't had any takers yet. I mean, it hasn't had any governments that's wanted to sign up. And, um, and so, you know, that, that, that is uh, an issue. So I mentioned, for instance, this, the problem of data trusts. Um, um, so then the question is, what, what have other governments done? So the EU has, uh, in April of 2018, they've done a proposed regulation on both a European production order and a European preservation order. And they um, require that any electronic service provider into the EU has got to uh, appoint a representative. And that representative has to be um, subject to service a process in responding. And they, you know, they, they speed up the, the time to respond. So normally you would have 10 days, but if the EU country can show that it, it's urgent that somebody's life is at stake or inf, a critical infrastructure is at stake, then you only have 10 hours to um, respond. But so far, these, this regulation hasn't been finally adopted. It's only, um, it's only proposed. Um, yeah. So there's, then the UK has done a Crime Overseas Production Act. And that act was actually um, in February of this year, it's been enacted. And it's very similar very similar to the Cloud Act. Um, it would also enable, um, it would enable the UK, UK court to require, uh, to, to enable the UK law enforcement to go directly to foreign electronic service providers provided there's this reciprocal agreement. But so far, they're, they don't have any, but the, the UK law is still very new. So what about the Chinese? Um, they actually now have also passed legislation um, and they require service providers to keep their data in China and they provide uh, the Chinese government um, all kinds of ways to access that information. Um, and there is right now a lot of tension between China and the U.S. There's a, uh, I think it was about a week ago, the U.S. Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit upheld um, a contempt order against three Chinese banks, two of which are state-owned because the uh, D.C. court, the, the district court, um, did a contempt citation having to do with information about violating North Korean sanctions. And the Chinese bank said, look, the Chinese government has told us we can't comply, you've got to use the MLAT. Department of Justice, you know, weighed in and said, look, we have visited twice China just over this case, but we have given them all kinds of MLATs the last few years, and we either get no response or years go by before we get any response. And so the Court of Appeals has now affirmed, and that will be um, interesting to watch. Mm -hmm. um, so final thoughts. Is the Cloud Act a solution for balkanization of the web due to country by country data localization instead of a globally networked internet or just a starting point? What do you guys think? I'd be more hopeful that it's going to be useful if someone had signed up to it, but right now it just seems like an empty act. You know, and the other problem is, this is kind of a, 
issue of can the law keep up with the technology? Mm -hmm. I mean, when the Microsoft case happened, you know, the court was like, look, this law, Stored Communication Act is from 1986. In 1986, I mean, the web hardly, you know, existed. And so the law didn't even contemplate what's happening. What, there is a case in Philadelphia involving Google. What Google does is it constantly rotates the data on shards and according to some algorithm. And so, you know, where the data is week to week is gonna vary. And so it's, it's very hard here for the, 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 the legislatures and the executive branches to keep up with all the technological uh, developments. And, and just all the way, the different ways that the clouds, you know, clouds work. What, so. An interesting um, article in the New York Times just talked about how quickly things are moving and they talked about how cookies, you know, if you access a certain website, there's a cookie put on your computer and then that website, if you go back, knows your computer's visited it. And that's an interesting thing for us to collect as prosecutors to get information from your computer to say, well, you've accessed this site. The New York Times had an article that now it's evolved so that when you access different sites, you don't get that little pop-up. Um, you're going to get a cookie on your computer instead. The subtle collection of information is the device you're using, um, the serial number, the all these itty bitty subtle pieces of data now become a fingerprint that you're unaware even are being collected. And so when I read that article, I'm like, oh great. I mean, that's something now we should be collecting, right? About um, all of the defendants that are doing certain types of crimes, but most people are completely unaware of it. And I frankly knew some of it just from the search warrants attachments that we do and what we're asking to collect. But until I read it in the New York Times article, I wasn't aware how fully it's documenting the activities of pretty much everyone. So I, I don't think anyone is keeping up with the changes that are happening. And um, very clever individuals that want to commit crimes will put servers in their own homes in different countries so that uh, I had a case where someone um, purchased a piece of property and used a property that looked like it was a next door property but really was on the same site um, to store their server so that no one would know the server was even there. And you know these things are evolving so quickly and every so often law enforcement you know, bumbles upon something and then there's great coordination efforts and a big takedown that happened a few years ago was done by, done in New York City um, and the prosecutors had to obtain information from servers in all parts of the world. And once someone was caught in one country, they agreed to cooperate and then let the government use their server so that the other defendants that were relaying information into this server had no idea that this individual here had been caught. And so slowly, bit by bit, they gathered the information. So I, I don't think it'll ever be everyone's, the legislation, the prosecution, and you know, the defendants are the only ones that seem to me to be five steps ahead. Yep. Okay, so I think with that. Yeah, um, so we'll, we'll um, we're gonna switch gears, uh, and we're going to look at, um, we're gonna have Martha talk about um, uh, compelled statements and uh, um, what happens when, uh, um, you were in a country, so I'll, I'll, a Canadian, for example, I, I don't want to, um, in the Canadian self-incrimination protection is on the uh, back end, meaning that in Canada normally uh, you can be compelled to provide a statement, which is what's going to happen in the in the case Martha's going to go through, um, but then you get testimonial and derivative use mm -hmm. immunity. Um, and the interesting question of, well, what happens if you, if that statement is shared with a foreign authority that might have a very different concept of self-incrimination? So I am going to shift gears and talk about now what the innocent defendants can do to fight the government oppression that we've heard about now for the last hour and a half in terms of evidence collection. Um, the case I'm going to talk about real quickly um, is, is U.S. versus Allen, which is out of the Second Circuit. And this, this is a case in which the Second Circuit held that a statement um, that is compelled by a foreign government uh, is inadmissible in a criminal proceeding here in the U.S. under the under the Fifth Amendment, um, and the the case involved. And there's a spin-off case in New York that involved the Deutsche Bank. But the question was, if you if you there's an international you know parallel investigation. The U.K. Serious Fraud Office is investigating this. Is the LIBOR 
um, uh, investigation. The U.S. Second Circuit, the Southern District of New York, is investigating the same thing. Um, there's a witness, uh, uh, the defendant um, is, is uh, compelled, or a witness is compelled to make a statement in the UK. And in the UK, they can force you to make a statement. You don't, you don't get to invoke and refuse. They can force you to make a statement. And then that statement is then used um, in proceedings in the United States. And the Second Circuit held that, in fact, the Fifth Amendment privilege applies um, to statements that are compelled. And what that, what that means for a criminal defendant, if you're a defendant, um, is that if the statement is compelled, you can now raise a castigar issue in the U.S. A castigar issue meaning you can raise an issue with the judge and say that statement was compelled in the U.K. by the British authorities. That compelled statement was given to U.S. federal prosecutors. U.S. federal prosecutors then use that statement to gather evidence and that triggers uh, a, a castigar inquiry under a U.S. Supreme Court case that said if, if the government uses compelled testimony, testimony compelled in violation of the Fifth Amendment, the government has the burden to prove that other evidence in the case is not tainted by that compelled testimony. And in Allen, um, the Second Circuit found that, in fact, the uh, government's evidence was tainted because uh, the government's primary witness, cooperating witness, had reviewed the compelled statement of the defendant, the U.S. defendant. So um, this is a really interesting case from a defense lawyer's perspective because there are a lot of these investigations that are transnational and there's investigations going on on either side of the border and it's a way for a defense attorney to be able to use um, arguably screw-ups by the government um, you know, in, in their client's favor. The Allen case was then outside the international context, sort of, was then extended a little bit by the Second Circuit, or by a district court in the Second Circuit in um, uh, the Black and Connolly case, in which the court held that uh, an interview by Deutsche Bank, of a Deutsche Bank employee, a current employee, was compelled, because the employee would be fired if he, would, if he didn't submit to the interview, um, and it was compelled by Deutsche Bank, but the U.S. prosecutor, the U.S. Attorney's Office, was essentially directing Deutsche Bank's internal investigation. And therefore, that compulsion was attributable to the U.S. government in violation of the Fifth Amendment, and this, and this statement, again, triggered a castigar inquiry. In that case, the court found there was no taint. Um, but at any rate, um, pretty clearly, the Fifth Amendment would apply, and then it triggered the castigar. So, there are ways, and whenever you have a case uh, defending someone where there are foreign proceedings, you should always be looking to see how you can use that to your advantage for the defendant. Look to see how whatever statements your client might have made were compelled in a foreign, uh, by a foreign government, by a corporation who's cooperating with the U.S. government. Um, however, and in the same context on the MLAT side, uh, if, um, you know, evidence has been gathered by the prosecutor against your client in a foreign country, there are ways that you can look to see if you can exclude it. For instance, maybe the evidence was um, acquired in violation of foreign wiretap laws. Um, can you exclude that in a U.S. criminal proceeding if it was collected in violation of the foreign wiretap laws or other foreign laws? So. That's, um, we're like right at the cocktail hour, and I really hate keeping people away from <laughs> their cocktails. So, so maybe I can just, it. on the Allen case, if I understand, I, I, I did read it. So the, it, it, it doesn't look like the U.S. authorities actually had the compelled statement. They were using a witness who had reviewed the compelled statement, and that was enough of a taint. Right. Right. Okay. Although I think they, I don't remember, I think they actually. Do they obtain it? Obtained it, yes. Okay. So, and then, it, to me, into my mind, it's a bit of a contradiction, but I'm sure that there's a, uh, going back to the example of the Spanish case where the, the Spanish authorities uh, come in under an MLAT, they say, we want to examine this witness, we're entitled to do so. The witness in that case under the Fifth Amendment, if I understand correctly, is not entitled to invoke the Fifth Amendment by, because it's a foreign prosecution. Is that, that's right, right? Well, so it, it, that issue never arose. So okay. I don't know what would have happened if the defense attorney said, 
he's going to refuse to answer these questions. Right. The Spanish court would have been stuck. They're in Spain. Um, I'm here through the video with the person. I think we would have had to then bring it before a magistrate judge here and file briefings and have them rule on it. I, I don't know why. I think if someone is sitting here, even though it's a foreign proceeding where the Fifth Amendment may not be applicable, if by making certain statements they were going to incriminate themselves, I, I don't know. What, what do you think? I think that they may be able to refuse to answer the question. Well, the question would be whether that witness risked a criminal liability. Right. And if it did, whether it's in Spain or anywhere else. Well, you can't invoke the fifth. You can't invoke the U.S. Fifth Amendment if what you're fearing is prosecution in a foreign country. That's under that Balsas case. The Balsas case. case. Yeah, you case. So you okay. cannot. If, you're, if you say, oh, if I answer that question, Germany's going to prosecute me. You're a U.S. citizen. You can't invoke the Fifth Amendment. You might, if you're a German resident or citizen, might be able to say, well, no, I have a fifth, the equivalent of a Fifth Amendment privilege under German law, and so I'm not going to answer the question. But a U.S. court would say, well, we don't care. It only matters in the U.S. if it's a U.S. criminal proceeding that you mm. fear a prosecution or it would incriminate you here. So I, but so Balsas was decided in 1998, U.S. Supreme Court, and this is the, the, the facts of the case essentially are that the uh, defendant lied on his immigration entry into the U.S. He was a war criminal. He's wanted in Lithuania and Germany. And when he is brought forward to the administrative inquiry to determine whether he lied, he tries to take the fifth and say, well, I fear prosecution. But he doesn't fear prosecution in the U.S. The U.S. is just going to deport him. So he fears prosecution in Germany and Lithuania, and the U.S. Supreme Court says, no, that's not... It's not sufficient. You have to fear, uh, uh, have a reasonable fear of a U.S. prosecution. But when I look at the deciding, in, like the decision in Allen, I wonder if it's ripe for reconsideration because Allen seems to emphasize the fact that your Fifth Amendment right is a trial right. It's a personal right. It comes into play, you know, in the U.S. proceedings. And I think there's some kind of contradiction between the fact that Balsas was not able to invoke the Fifth for a foreign proceeding. But in the Allen case, they're able to invoke the fifth by saying, look, even though the, the statement was not taken by U.S. authorities, was overseas, I'm in the U.S. now. I want to invoke the right now. It's my, my trial right. One thing I was confused about is, is in the Allen case, is the is is the is Allen the defendant invoking his own? Fifth He's amendment? invoking his own Fifth okay, Amendment privilege. As, as he was me. over in the UK right. doing work, and they go interview him by the serious fraud office. He's compelled in the UK to do it. Then they extradite right. him from the UK over here. He's right. prosecuted over here. It's his own statement that was compelled. Right. But the claim wouldn't apply if the compelled statement was of someone other than the defendant. Right. Words, right. They, right. It's personal right. to the defendant. That's right. right. And so in, in the FCA, the, the securities regulatory body in the UK initially charges him with a regulatory administrative offense. You can still, I mean, if it's like Canada, you can still go to jail, but it's a, it's a quasi-criminal proceeding. Then the U.S. Department of Justice comes along and says, well, we're going to prosecute him. So they stay their proceedings. Now, again, I presume that British Canadian law are similar. Uh, you can reinstitute a proceeding after it's stayed. So, you know, depending on the result, I don't know what happened to Mr. Allen, um, but the FCA might say, well, we tried, they tried to prosecute you in the U.S. It failed, so we are going to now reinstitute our proceedings here. But I think in, the, in Allen, the, he, his statement in the U.K. was compelled. Um, had it not, he tried to invoke... He said, no, if I make that statement, it's going to incriminate me in, in the US. U.S. Right. And the U.K. said, we don't care. You have to answer. And so in Balsas, the guy didn't say, no, it's going to incriminate me, me in the U.S. Right. And so the Supreme Court says, no, the Fifth Amendment applies. It's Only. personal right. And the other thing you have to distinguish between when you're looking at these issues is if it's a statement, there's two different ways in which you might keep that statement out. One is under the Fifth Amendment and say, oh, it's compelled. And the other is under the due process clause and say, oh, it was involuntary. And those are two different things, and the laws are different in terms of how they apply and, and all that. So you've got to be sensitive to what, what you're alleging about the statement, right. what's wrong right. with it. Right. So I, I note the time is 4.58. I'm, I'm going to, in literally two minutes, go through very quickly the international silver platter doctrine, which talks about the difference between this personal trial right and uh, a more general um, Constitutional, but I, it, it, there's only, I think there's six slides, and so I'm going to go through this uh, super quick, but just because it's a, a good comparison. Um, 
So I'll start, for those of you that are not familiar uh, with the International Silver Platter, Platter Doctrine, it starts with the, um, it comes out of the, uh, there you go, that's it. Perfect. Old case law, which is no longer valid in the US, uh, which was um, pre-14th Amendment, where basically, so you have a right against unreasonable search and seizure, uh, that only applied to the federal government, the state would sometimes uh, commit these egregious uh, searches and then just turn the evidence over to the federal prosecutors. And the court for a long time decided, said, well, look, I mean, it wasn't the federal government, which is who the Fourth Amendment applies to, that committed, uh, you know, this illegal activity, um, so we're going to allow it to come in. Uh, even under the old doctrine, there was an exception, um, which is, is what we've talked about, which is, look, if, if the federal government is really in the background directing and conducting the search, obviously the Fourth Amendment should apply. They don't have the right to circumvent the Constitution. Um, but the Fourth Amendment functions differently than the Fifth Amendment in the international context because the courts have said, look, the Fourth Amendment right to search and seizure is, is not a personal trial right. It's, it's designed... Uh, to deter law enforcement um, from, from basically circumventing the amendment, and the Fourth Amendment only applies generally to American law enforcement authorities. So for foreign police, they have no such constrictions, um, and the international silver platter doctrine has outlasted its domestic cousin from which it originated and which was overturned in 1960 by the, uh, the U.S. Supreme Court in a case called Elkins. So uh, if the Canadian government, Irish government, what have you, um, decides on their own that they are going to conduct a search, and that search would violate the Fourth Amendment, but the U.S. authorities were not involved, and then at the end of it, the Canadian or Irish authorities say, here you go, here's this evidence you obtained, you're out of luck in a U.S. court to say, well, look, I'm a U.S. citizen, this would violate my, my rights under the Fourth Amendment. Two very narrow exceptions, one is, if it would shock the judicial conscience, which is not actually a Fourth Amendment principle, it's just a supervisory principle of the court, which says, I mean, and, and the examples they always give are torture, basically, if, it, if, if, if it's obtained or, or somehow, uh, um, you know, the documents are found under torture, then fine, we'll exclude it. But the second is, just like the original silver platter doctrine, if there's substantive involvement of the American authorities, but the circuit split on what that means. So the second circuit says you have to have uh, agency or virtual agency. Um, so you think of the principal agency relationship, where basically, uh, just like the Deutsche Bank case, the US authorities are effectively directing and controlling and conducting the search, the investigation in the background. Um, then fine, the second circuit will say, the Fourth Amendment kicks in and you might be able to exclude the evidence. Um, but it's a very high standard, and this is um, another one of my favorite cases because you think under the, in the Second Circuit, if this case doesn't qualify, no case is going to ever make it. I mean, this is a situation where there's a joint investigation between the Jamaicans and the American law enforcement. Um, there's formalized cooperation. There's an MOU. The MOU says that Jamaican constabulary will gather evidence for both its own purposes and the U.S. purposes, and that it will share that evidence with the U.S. authorities, and the U.S. provides surveillance uh, training and the equipment. And it's turned over to the U.S. authorities, and they prosecute Mr. Lee, and Mr. Lee says, come on, like, this is Fourth Amendment, like, this, this is the same as if I were basically, there was a search and seizure by U.S. authorities uh, in my backyard, and the Second Circuit says, no, because it's, it's, there's no evidence that the U.S. authorities are actually directing the search. They're just providing all of this equipment and this training and this information to the Jamaican authorities. And yes, they share it, but that's not enough. That's not enough to exclude it. Then there's the Ninth Circuit, which, which says it's a lower standard. It's just a joint venture. And a joint venture obviously doesn't require principal agency relationship. And in those circumstances, it becomes a, um, a bit of an unusual inquiry because if a joint venture is found, the court will then look at whether or not the foreign laws were complied with. So if it was the Irish police, they would then look at and have an inquiry in the US courts about whether or not Irish laws were complied with. And if they weren't, then the search might be found to be unreasonable and it's kicked out under the exclusionary rule of the Fourth Amendment. That's it in a nutshell. I think I... It's 5.04, so I know it's cocktail hour. Thank you very much, everyone. Um.